Good Friday afternoon, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and welcome to the I Love Seville show. We're live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville network. It's great to connect with you. Very much enjoy the human connection through this platform. I think you're going to love today's show. We'll introduce you to three people in our community that are without question leaving Charlottesville and Central Virginia in a better place. Marty Phipps is going to join us. He is uh, doing some big time things through Old Dominion Hemp. Chris Skipper is going to join us. I'm super excited for Chris to come on today's show. An exercise and nutrition coach. If you see the results Chris Skipper has done with his body, his outlook, and how he goes about his day to day, you will just you will be left motivated, energized, and a better positive perspective on life. We'll talk about that with Chris. He routinely shows vulnerability on his social media, and that's what makes him so genuine, such a leader, such a positive agent of change. We'll talk about that vulnerability and the changes he's made with his life, physically, emotionally, and personally, and how he can pass along that experience to many in Charlottesville and across Central Virginia. It's Friday, so the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust is in the spotlight. Susan Steimart, the executive director, will join us as this organization works so hard to keep our community affordable for so many. You, the viewer, the listener, can offer perspective on today's show. Dictate the pace and tempo by offering your thoughts in the comment section on any of the social media platforms you're watching this show upon. Your perspective will be then relayed live on air. We'll give some love, Judah Wickhauer, to Interstate Pest and Service Companies. Truly a home's best friend, Interstate Pest and Service Companies. They are a four-generation strong business that is committed to keeping this community positive, healthy, safe, and keeping your home as truly a best friend. Interstate Pest and Service Companies. The first headline, school board meetings last night for Charlottesville City Schools, and there were some troubling statistics that we learned yesterday from the school board. And Judah, if you can get the Daily Progress headline on screen, Catherine Knott does a good job covering education for the Daily Progress. Folks, I'm going to cut to the chase. There are 220 less students in Charlottesville City Schools when compared to September 30th of last year. You heard me correctly. 220 less students in the Charlottesville public school system when compared to September 30, 2019. Why is this impactful? Well, we know that enrollment determines funding from the Commonwealth. So the city school system has straight up said, look, we're going to have a drop of 480000 to 500000 in less money in state funding. So half a million dollars less in state funding for the public school system in Charlottesville City Schools because you saw 220 kids, their parents, pull them out of city schools September 30, 2020 versus September 30, 2019. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal. Parents pulling their kids out of city schools for learning at home in a homeschool setting, learning in a neighborhood, at a pod setting, or transitioning their children to private schools where many, if not all, except Miller School, um, the Miller School, the only one that we know of that is not doing in-person learning from a private school standpoint. So when you're minus $500,000 for a public school system, folks, that's like 12 or 13 teachers from a compensation standpoint that you have less money for. I am very fearful, and I've said this on this program many times, I am very fearful that the public school model is in a precarious and fragile position. Kids are being asked to learn in antiquated buildings with antiquated ventilation when maybe it's one janitor that's being asked to keep the school clean and, and free, with vi free of viruses that we know can um, spread very quickly. So is the public school model across the country 
is the public school model here in Charlottesville and Albemarle County in a fragile position? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Now, I stand with teachers. I have said routinely on this program, teachers are underpaid and undervalued, and that is absolutely um, terrifying to me because they're molding the next generation of humans that are going to impact our country. So we need to figure out a way to do the following. We got to figure out a way to get our frontline workers, our teachers, um, more compensation, more equity, just basically close and bridge the gap with what teachers are making and should be making. I'm going to also cut to the chase, and this could be an unpopular opinion. The longer we go with students not in the classroom, the more precarious, the more fragile, the more uncertain the future of public schools across the country, in Virginia, in the Commonwealth, and certainly in Charlottesville and the surrounding counties. When a school system like Charlottesville is projecting $480,000 to $500,000 um, in lost revenue because enrollment is leaving the public schools, you need to have your antennas up. We need to see the long game here. We oftentimes ask city council and the board of supervisors on this network to understand the long game and see the forest through the trees. Yes, we want to keep teachers safe. Yes, we want to keep administrators and students safe. Yes, we're very fearful and mindful of COVID. The longer we go without students interacting with students, elementary in particular, interacting with kids at the elementary school level is as important as ABCs, 123s, geography, history, art, and PE. Elementary school education is all about social behavior, learning to keep your hands to yourself, learning to behave and follow the rules. Those mindsets and nuances are learned and absolutely absorbed much easier in an in-person setting as opposed to learning over a Zoom on a computer like this. So $500,000, um, the projected number for a lack of funding if the enrollment continues like this. I'm going to say this before I go to the next headline. The longer we wait, the longer we keep students in the public school system learning at home through a virtual setting, the more fragile, the more vulnerable, and the more precarious the state of our public school system will be. You heard that. Our next headline on the I Love Seville show, Judah Wickhauer, a positive one. Ivy Provisions, one of our favorite places for sandwiches in Charlottesville, Virginia, opened yesterday for carryout and takeout. Ivy Provisions, the sister restaurant of Fry Spring Station, Shadwell's on Pantops, in Augusta Kitchen in Augusta County, Virginia. PK, Ben, Tommy, the owners behind this restaurant group start with the brand that's been around the longest from an ownership standpoint, and that's Ivy Provisions. I love that this spot is back open. I love their sandwiches. And at the bottom of the show, we'll talk about our favorite sandwich options in the Charlottesville and Central Virginia area. Ivy Provisions makes a fantastic Sammy. Take out and carry out for now. Hopefully down the road, maybe some outside seating, maybe 50% capacity inside. Either way, props and kudos to you guys for opening up. Um, we are going to go to the Fox Field races. And before we do, let's highlight the fact that Fry Spring Stations, Shadwell's, and Augusta Kitchen are very close to opening as well. Now let's talk Foxfield races. The fall Foxfield races happen this weekend. And the fall Foxfield races are the family friendly version of Foxfield. The spring version is the version that I first got a taste of as a student at the University of Virginia. The fraternities, the sororities, the hardcore tailgating, the having fun, the, the getting after it. The fall Foxfield races the family-friendly version. 
Unfortunately for Foxfield, much like many other events in this COVID-19 landscape, Foxfield will go on without fans this year. A total bummer, right? Can you imagine the Foxfield races with nobody in attendance? Well, we're about to get a taste of it this weekend. They're going to try to live stream the event to social and to websites. We wish the folks that are hosting Foxfields the best. We cannot wait until we get back to in-person enjoying events like this. Foxfields without fans is like college football and UVA game day without people in Scott Stadium. It's just very difficult to swallow. Foxfield, regardless, we wish you the best. Now, speaking of no fans in the stands, how about James Madison University? Now, James Madison University has straight up said, we are down, and if you can get that headline on screen, that would be great, Jude. It is on screen now. They are down, from a deficit standpoint, $5.5 million with its athletic department. JMU's athletic department and its athletic director have straight up said, we are hurting, we are in trouble. Here's a couple things to consider. JMU was scheduled to play um, UNC um, Chapel Hill, the North Carolina Tar Heels. JMU was going to travel this fall to North Carolina to Chapel Hill. Just for making the trip, JMU was going to get a check for $500,000 just for making the trip to North Carolina. Remember, JMU in the spring stopped all spring sports midseason due to COVID-19. JMU generated roughly $10.6 million. I'll repeat that. JMU generated $10.6 million in revenue from football in the 2018-2019 academic year. Well, football's not happening. So like William & Mary, and William & Mary is the college that I grew up going to. I grew up going to Zabel Stadium, watching Jimmy Laycock coach the William & Mary tribe. I, go, I grew up watching basketball games at William & Mary. William & Mary, because of budget deficits, is slashing sports off its docket. Unfortunately, many of the sports that William & Mary is cutting are sports tied to females, volleyball, softball cross country, and golf, just to name a few. Those sports, unfortunately, lose money. So William & Mary, its athletic department, much like JMU, is hemorrhaging money. So the tribe and its athletic director and its admins have said, we are going to cut these sports out of our athletic department to try to stop the bleeding. Right now, William & Mary is facing the threat of a class action lawsuit from its alumni and its current athletes saying, why are you cutting our sports and not men's basketball and not football? Well, we know the answer for that. And unfortunately, that answer is, it's money. It's money. JMU in a similar position. JMU's athletic department has said, look, the cost of scholarships are skyrocketing. The NCAA offered a waiver to athletes in the spring who had their semester and their athletic season cut short due to COVID. And the NCAA said the athletes who had their spring athletic season cut short, they can come back to colleges across America, stay on scholarship, and redo a spring season that was cut short. Well, JMU has said, look, this waiver that the NCAA has offered is going to cost us an additional $250,000 in scholarship money. Add that to the fact that we're not getting the $500,000 check for the trip to North Carolina to, for football. Add that to the fact that we didn't get the $10.7 million we got for having a college football season in the fall. And we're in a really tough spot. Remember, earlier this week, we explained to you that student body enrollment for the fall semester at JMU was negative. Remember, JMU started the season with in-person. Six days after starting in-person, it decided to go to virtual learning because of an outbreak on campus. As a result, students and parents said, no way, Jose. Give us our money back. We'll take a gap year 
or the semester off. As a result, JMU student body enrollment is down year over year. Its athletic department down year over year. And now we have the athletic director with the proverbial hat in his hand asking people for money, asking people for gifts, doing the GoFundMe campaign like the University of Virginia and like Virginia Tech. Folks, I'm going to straight up say this. The athletic departments that are not part of the Power Five conferences, the ACC, the SEC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, the Pac-12, the ones outside the Power Five, very much like our public school systems, are in a vulnerable and very precarious position. I expect sports and offerings from the athletic departments from Virginia to California, Texas to Alaska, to be trimmed and cut. And the really crappy part about this, the sports that will be axed are the ones that are female-focused sports. There's a crazy statistic that's out there. We've talked about this often on this show. We were very concerned that females, from a business standpoint, would feel the pinch of COVID-19 more than males. It's not fair, but it is what's happening. Moms and wives are picking up more of the burden of childcare and virtual learning. It's not fair, but it is a reality. As moms and wives assume more of the burden of childcare and virtual learning at home, their career trajectory from a professional standpoint has been diminished. So all the gains that we made of closing the gender gap from a corporate, from a career, from a vertical ladder climb standpoint, those gains are slowly being diminished. We're seeing it in athletics at the collegiate level. We're seeing it in corporate America. COVID-19 is a nasty, mean beast that is changing human behavior, that is altering the gains that we've made over the decades with closing or bridging the gender gap. We'll follow that closely on the show, but I can tell you, when you cut volleyball, women's golf, cross-country tennis and softball, and sports that create a competitive team environment, it's going to impact it's going to impact women, not only at the collegiate level, but as they matriculate into a professional career where they're asked to be in a team working environment. Just watch that, please. Our next headline on the show comes from Roanoke. We follow the trends across the Commonwealth because we can apply those trends to the city we love in Charlottesville, Virginia. There's a Roanoke City Councilor that resigned from council mid tenure in unexpected fashion. Roanoke, the city, has had 21 individual applicants to fill the vacant spot for city council. 21. Now you ask me, Jerry, why are you bringing up Dejuana Osborne and the fact that Dejuana Osborne resigned last month with two years left on her term? The reason I'm bringing it up, boys and girls, and those that watch on the I Love Seville show is because we have someone on our city council where a number of folks, including the folks that were her champions that helped get her into office and Mayor Nikaya Walker, many people in the community now asking for her resignation. We see folks from a police department, from a city executive department, from a city manager standpoint, from a downtown business owners association standpoint, asking, begging, pleading for her resignation. It's happened in Roanoke, it can happen in Charlottesville. I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm not gonna go down the road on a Friday with a lot of positivity coming up on today's program. But two hours from here, we saw a city councilor resign. And now the city has 21 people 
looking to fill her spot in the Roanoke Valley. I think a similar situation would play out in Charlottesville, Virginia. Still to come on today's program, we will talk um, about the Patriot League and the fact that its men's basketball offering in the Patriot League is looking like it's not going to have any out-of-conference games. We'll talk about UVA and Clemson and the fact that the Tigers are now a 28.5 point favorite. It started at 28.5 on Monday. It trickled down to 27.5 midweek. Now it's back to 28.5, 8 p.m. kickoff on the ACC Network. Virginia Tech on Monday opened as a 10.5 point favorite against the Duke Blue Devils. Now the Hokies up to 12.5 points as a favorite with the 4 p.m. kickoff on the ACC Network. We'll talk date night. It's Friday on the I Love Seville show and some date night choices for you along with sandwiches and Italian food on today's program. Of course, we'll take your comments, your perspective on the show. Just put them anywhere on the feed, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, YouTube, email, direct message on I Love Seville. There's so many places for you to engage with today's show. Um, Judah, why don't we let them know how they can save $288 on Ting Fiber Internet. You can only get a $288 savings on Ting Fiber Internet through iloveseville.ting.com. The best internet that is used to run this network at the best price possible, iloveseville.ting.com. Judah, I have Marty on the line from Old Dominion Hemp. Marty, we're excited to welcome you to the broadcast. You have quite a few people watching you here. Thank you, Barbara Lungrid, for sharing the show. Vanessa Parkhill, thank you for setting up this interview. We see that you're watching. Troy Gray, hello. Um, I count four different states now watching you, Marty. Um, welcome to the show. Before we talk about your business and the evolution of your brand, how about an introduction to you personally? Marty, what are you all about? Uh, well, uh, I would say that I'm a, a Virginian through and through. Uh, hard worker, uh, good morals, and, um, you know, I, I just try to be true to myself. So I, I would say that uh, my philosophy is, is one that is um, pretty easy, you know, um, treat people with dignity and respect. Um, I was raised to respect my elders, and um, I'm passing that along to my three-year-old, and uh, hopefully those uh, morals and values will hold true. Great answer. We have a lot in common. I have a two and a half year old. Um, I very much um, embody the golden rule or try to. Um, a family business, my wife actively involved in it. We grind and work hard. Let's talk about Old Dominion Hemp. Um, the flip book of the business and brand. When did it start, Marty? So I started Old Dominion in 2015. Um, we did a basically research and development. Uh, we did not go live or to the public in to the, until 2016. Um, the product that we got in, we donated to uh, the Retirement Thoroughbred Foundation, uh, the Charlottesville Search and uh, Rescue Equine Division, and got some feedback from people that would really cut it to a straight, whether this was a good betting product or not. Uh, we quickly found that um, the response was, where can I buy this? Um, so once we, we found like we had a, a good material uh, to enter the market, uh, we started doing horse shows in, into 2016. Um, it was a lot of education. Um, you know, hemp is something that has been uh, illegal really to, to uh, uh, obtain or even grow for the last 80 years. Uh, so bringing that to the forefront, um, there was a lot of uh, questions that I had to answer. Uh, some of those were, were fun. Um, you know, people were always asking if my horse eats this material. Will, will they get, get high? Yeah. Right, right, right. 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 So it, that's something that, you know, we even still hear that. And, and, you know, we have some people that even tell on themselves at some of these horse shows where they'll walk by and they'll be like, oh, I grew that stuff in the 70s. And, you know, I was just sort of snickered. And, and think, well, this you probably didn't grow this. 
Um, a Chris Barber is watching in Martinsville, and he says this, and, and I, I'm going to echo and agree with this. Um, Jerry, I love your show. I'm a UVA graduate who's moved to Martinsville for family. I try to tune into your program as much as possible. Can you ask this question to your guests? And it's probably a dumb question. It's not, because I also have this question. Ask your guests, what is hemp? So uh, hemp is basically a rotational crop that can be utilized for American farmers. Um, I have some pieces of, of hemp herd right here. And basically, as the hemp grows, the stalk, um, once that stalk has matured and the herd has matured, we take the fiber off of the, the, the hemp plant. And this fiber is one of the strongest fibers in the world. When they strip the fiber from the stalk, this is the material that is left over the herd that we utilize for our animal bedding. It's extremely absorbent. Uh, the material is a, lo a low dust material. It's also being a plant-based material. It's also very biodegradable. Um, so really hemp, you know, has some very popular um, cousins, if you will. Uh, but really what we utilize is an industrial hemp. We do not use CBD or medicinal hemp for our um, bedding product. You know, we use an industrial or textile fiber um, plant. And basically that's what hemp is. It's just a, another rotational crop. Um, you're getting props and love already. I see you're a popular guy. Um, one person that's sending you um, some love is Michelle temples. She says, hi, Marty Phipps with the kiss emoji right there. Um, you have now six states watching you on the program. So a lot of questions coming in. Guys, I'll get to these questions here in a matter of moments. Before I do, I have some questions for Marty himself. Who is Old Dominion Hemp's customer base? So our customer base is um, the equestrian, the poultry, and any small animal uh, betting market that exists out there. We introduced our product into the equine market and we started with, with horses. Uh, very quickly, uh, we started to gain ground in the backyard chicken movement. Um, this product has been great for reducing odor for chickens and the dust, and um, we've had some really great success. Um, just recently here within the last month, we've actually developed a six pound bag uh, that will be utilized for smaller pets such as gerbils and hamsters. Um, we have a tremendous uh, reptile following uh, with our product. So now that we've developed a smaller bag, um, we can really touch base of any pet owner uh, that needs a bedding, whether it's cats, dogs, iguanas, hamsters, all the way up to llamas, horses, peacocks. It's, it's pretty crazy the people that reach out to us with the different animals they have um, and that have been able to utilize this bedding and, and, and be happy with it. Um, Rebecca C. Bushy watching you. Andy Wilfong watching you. Barbara Lundgren, thank you for sharing the show. Seven states watching Old Dominion Hemp on the program here. Uh, I will get to these questions. We do have some questions, as you can imagine, coming from a cannabis perspective. Um, before we get to that, um, other topics I want to get to. So how do we buy the product and what's your plan for scale and growth uh, for Old Dominion Hemp? Well, thank you for that. Um, on our webpage, we have a list of different states that carry our product and different retail outlets. We also sell directly to the client, and all they would have to do is go to our, our webpage, www.odhemp.com, fill out the contact form um, for the material that they are seeking, and we can direct them to the best, either the closest place to them, or we can ship it to them directly. We, we have confirmed sales in three-fourths of the United States, and, and we're hoping to continue growing with that. So our plan for scaling is basically when we started this day one, we wanted to show American farmers that there was a need for hemp to be grown and that there's a tremendous amount of market for it. Um, we are just a small portion of the hemp industry in the animal bedding market. But the material that we utilize for bedding can also be utilized for pulping paper, uh, slurry for oil, uh, oil companies, 
Um, plastics can be made from this same material. So it's a very disruptive um, uh, industry that, that's getting ready to emerge. So for us to scale forward, we need domestic supply. Um, we have been importing this material for you know almost five years now. Um, and so what we need is the domestication of this to be grown as a rotational crop by American farmers and also have the facility set up that can process the textile material. Um, there's other large companies, BMW would utilize this fiber for their car parts. Patagonia would use this for their materials. So there's very large companies that are waiting for this industry to emerge. Um, we just need that supply and the bureaucracy really to be cut out and let these farmers grow and, um, and, and, and remove the hurdles that exist. I think, I think you're on the cusp of that um, and more on that in a second here. So I, the three things, our three revenue streams are tied to real estate ownership, where we have 27 tenants, this network, and most importantly, as the owner of an advertising agency. So as the owner of an advertising agency, I'm essentially the priest in a confessional where business owners first, you know, or startup, small business, medium size, and large scale sit at my desk in confessional and tell me the good, the bad, the ugly of what's going on with their model, and then I honor their privacy. But it's a phenomenal um, crash course or, or MBA in business across a lot of industries. So in 12 years of doing this, Marty, I've learned quite a bit. I would think the challenge with your model is an educational challenge where you with the marketplace are having to educate the consumer or the big brands on the value of hemp. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely so. And I will say, um, you know, what has helped is being accepted uh, into the uh, equestrian or horse world and the backyard chicken world because word of mouth is spreading like wildfire. And so once we have, you know, that entry point into those markets, such as the equestrian and poultry markets and, and now emerging into small animal, that starts to, to, to develop. So where, you know, being a, a, a small company that has a relatively zero marketing budget, um, we are very blessed to have the industry itself accept us. And that has allowed for our, our internal growth is really proving that we do have a product. And you're right. The educational aspect is- That's is expensive. Yes. Yes. It, it's a lot of time um, because, again, you know, people aren't quite familiar with what is hemp, you know, is it something that you're, is an illegal drug that I would, now you're asking me to put my, you know, pride and joy animal on? It's not, you know, those are things where the separation, uh, hemp, very much like tomatoes have, like cherry tomato, big boy tomato, hemp has the same type of family. Cannabis as a whole has very different um, genealogies or species throughout that. And so we're just an industrial part of that. Uh, that's bred for zero THC um, and, and also CBDs, where there's other outlets of that within the cannabis family. So it is edu educational. Yeah, and I'll tell you, um, from a, as a guy who owns an advertising agency, having to educate a marketplace on a product or a service is, is, is expensive and time-consuming. Um, oftentimes, basically what he's saying is, is he's creating, along with other people in his space, they're creating the market. They're creating the category. And you're exactly right. When the folks that are in equestrian and horseback riding, they are becoming evangelists for your product. you got right. people that, if they're riding horses, you know they have disposable income. You, you have people with disposable income that are, are championing or becoming evangelists of your offering, and that's a very good way for you to scale and build your brand. Now, you have questions coming in from North Carolina, um, from outside Philly, and what looks like to be um, Georgia right now. And as you can imagine, a lot of the questions are tied to cannabis in some fashion here. I've said many times on this program that the Commonwealth 
heck, from a federal government standpoint, it's time for us to legalize cannabis. We're at the point where it's been decriminalized, where in Virginia, you can get popped with an ounce of cannabis and only get a $50 ticket, or in most cases, the police officer will turn his or her back and not even write you up at all. We also know that the Commonwealth and many states in our union are operating at tremendous budget deficits due to COVID-19. And as a result, I would encourage legislators to think entrepreneurially or innovative for new ways to generate incremental tax revenue as opposed to the old school ways of generating tax revenue, which is basically going to people like us and asking for more money. Um, right. Anywhere you want to go on this topic, open-ended question. The show is yours on this topic, Marty. Well, I would say, you know, Colorado, California, and some of those other states are, are prime examples. Um, the places when I've visited Colorado over the last five years, the only thing I've seen is better roads, a cleaner city. Um, my uh, cousin is a judge there. She's even seen a reduction in crime uh, due to some of the relaxation of the cannabis laws. And, and I think, you know, Virginia's so close to D.C., um, we're not going to ruffle feathers. But I think you're right. I think individual states need to really take a stand. And whether it's cannabis in the medicinal or recreational side or cannabis in the industrial farming or CBD side, there is revenue, revenue to be had here. Um, taxable dollars that can create jobs. When we first started this, and the, the way that I got into hemp was through the Virginia Industrial Hemp Coalition. Um, I'm also a regional director for that um, uh, organization. And before hemp was legalized in the state of Virginia, our group went to the state house. We, we got the university um, professors together. We got the lawmakers together. We slowly introduced uh, hemp into the state of Virginia that allowed really restrictions to be lifted. We did the testings with the universities. And then when the farm bill was uh, signed in 2018, it really did open the door. And I thought by now, you know, I would be rolling in hemp. Uh, I am but it's European. And, and our goal the whole time was to establish an industry here in the United States. How does your margin get impacted? I would think the margin becomes much fatter if the hemp is Commonwealth hemp as opposed to European hemp. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, and on top of yeah, that, you it, would be creating jobs. Yes, right. And not only creating jobs, but the monies that we would be making. I mean, I run a very, very tight margin. And that supply issue and that margin issue are things that we deal with on a daily basis. Having domestic supply um, and, and growth here domestically gives us the ability to expand into a national brand, which we have aspirations to do. But without that supply here domestically, you can't it's do it. Possible. Yeah. 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 I, I have, I have uh, um, clients that just this week from California have asked for truckloads of material. And you and didn't have the I supply it, for it, did you? What? No, I, we have the supply, but the shipping from once I import it and then ship it all the way from Virginia to California, it becomes a price point. Um, so we can, we're moving into the Midwest and we're slowly gaining ground, but really to hit those, uh, you know, California has one of the largest horse population states in the United States. And so to be able to tap into that market, we need something here um, coming from Europe. It just doesn't make sense for those customers right now. So, so, Even though they're hearing great things about it. Yeah, so you're ba he's basically saying this. And Susan Steinmart, if you're watching, um, we will get to you, Susan Steinmart, from the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust, about 1027, 1028, Susan Steinmart. Um, so you're basically saying the cost to ship the product from Europe to you to California, each stage of shipping adds increased costs and you obviously are trying to run a business in the black. So you got to pass those increased costs down the line. And at that point, it becomes a price point game. That's right. And, and what we've noticed, even with the COVID issues, is um, shipping globally. 
You see, you're getting, you're on the show right now. You're getting orders through your phone as you speak. You got a hell of a lot of people watching you on the show. Literally, you have seven states watching you right now. Oh, that's incredible. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity, again, to educate the public on not only what we do, but what hemp is and, and what we really need from, from people to further this uh, uh, this cause. Um, all right. Why don't you kill this interview, Marty Phipps? I'm, I'm serious. Why don't you close with um, a final word? The final word could be to Richmond, um, to the legislators in Richmond. It can be D.C. It can be anything you want, anywhere you want to go. On uh, any anything any anything you want to do, Marty, show is yours. Sure, I think my final word would be support your local farmers. Um, we don't exist, and this industry does not exist unless those seeds are put in the ground. Um, without somebody to grow it, we have nothing. We can build the machines to process this material all day, but without the farmer, we have nothing. And and that's probably across the board with a lot of industries. You killed it, man. Thank you. So good. Thank you. Yeah, so good, thank Marty. Um, Vanessa Parkhill, thank you for helping us set up that interview. Um, Chris Skipper, I'm going to go to you in T minus 20 seconds. I want to dot the I's and cross the T's on this. Um, I'm very much, a, I am a libertarian. Okay, I am a, the definition of a libertarian. I am fiscally conservative, fiscally conservative, socially liberal. Okay, socially liberal, women's rights. Women are rock stars. Women can do stuff that I cannot do. I saw my kid come out of my wife at Martha Jefferson, and I realized that she was a hell of a lot stronger than I ever will ever be. Okay, a woman has the right to do, um, this is just me. I'm not putting it on you. It's just me talking. A woman has a right to do with what, what she wants with her body. Okay, I, I do not care who you fall in love with. I do not care who you fall in love with. Okay, it's, tw it's 2020, understood? What I do care about is the government being in my pocket, the government, local, commonwealth, federal, telling me what to do with my hard-earned income. I am busting my ass working 70 hours a week. I've taken one vacation in 12 years as a small business owner. I have people counting on me to perform on a day in and day out basis. And many of you embody this mindset, okay? I, I, I encourage, implore, demand, ask respectfully that we come up with incremental ways to drive tax revenue in this budget deficit we're in across America due to COVID-19. And one of those incremental ways is, is the, and J-Dubs, you got this one over here? One of those incremental ways is undoubtedly the legalization of cannabis. It's been decriminalized. It has been decriminalized already. And on top of that, there's a disproportionate amount of people that are African American that have been arrested due to cannabis versus white people. One of the ways we will create social justice is by eliminating disproportionate arrests for the same transgression. Understood? And I think if we get to the point where we have a different mindset with, with hemp, cannabis, CBD, and all the brothers and sisters in that category, it's going to open up incremental revenue, taxable. It's going to open up new jobs. And we will realize that we were antiquated in our thinking. I own stock in Constellation Brands, and I own stock in Canopy Growth Company. And Canopy Growth Company, Constellation Brands is the parent company of Canopy Growth Company. Canopy Growth Company is a cannabis company in Canada. Constellation Brands is the money behind Canopy Growth. And both these companies are pushing and touting cannabis from a beverage standpoint and its variations. So we'll see what happens in 2021 as we try to make up these budget deficits. Chris Skipper, I'm reaching out to him now. Susan Steinbart, we have not forgotten you. Um, Chris Skipper, we're going to get to you. J Dobbs, you're going to get this panel for me when you can? All right, we got Chris Skipper on the line. This is going to be a tremendous interview. Chris, you are live for a lot of people. How are you, my friend? I Thank you for coming on the show. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tout you, and I'm going to give you some props, okay? Okay. Uh, I've known this gentleman 
for roughly a year and change. When I first met this gentleman, he was starting his journey to change his outlook on life from a personal, physical, and mental standpoint. This man has done an absolute about face, and now when you come into Chris Skipper's orbit, you are drawn to his positive energy, his leadership, you are drawn to his physique, the swagger he carries himself with, and in 13 months, it's done an absolute about face. Is that fair, Chris? I, I appreciate that, and I, I've put a lot of hard work in to a lot of different change, mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, yeah, I've, I've worked very hard. Um, we have so many people feeling hopeless and vulnerable, and we add the COVID-19 BS to it, and it compounds those feelings. Can you give us the flip book of your journey starting from the beginning? Sure, absolutely. Um, I lived... Um, an extremely sedentary life um, for 30 years. You know, I'm 30. Um, so really 29, I started I started uh, joined ACAC Fitness and Wellness Centers, which is my home away from home um, in September of last year, actually on a dare. A friend dared me to do it. And I was like, okay, yeah, all right. Um, I had gotten really tired of... Um, not being the version of myself that I, I, I hoped I could be, you know, as a, as a young child struggling with morbid obesity, I always wanted to be one of those guys um, on the basketball court or, you know, long distance running, lifting weights, whatever. Um, and so finally, I just got fed up. And so I joined the gym and um, I, I, you know, it was frightening, like, you know, big life changes are, are frightening, especially when everything you know has been lies told about genetics or things that you can and can't do, um, limitations that are put on us at a society level where health's concerned, which just a lot of it is just fallacy. It's, it's false. So I started working out, um, I got a trainer, um, but most importantly, um, I started really focusing on my nutrition and not just what I was eating, but how and why, um, and miracles started to happen. Like I think in the last year I've gone from 349 pounds to 100 or, uh, 247. Okay. Hold on one second. From 349 to 247 in one year. All right, yes. can you go to the studio cam? Dude, I'm going to give this dude... I mean, I effing love that. He drew... 100 pounds, Chris? Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. feeling the positive energy through the screen, dude. How did you go about doing it? you got a ton of people giving you props right now. Jamie Stuckey is giving you some props. Stacey Brookman. I mean, people loving this. How did you... We're showing the before and afters on screen. I love the vulnerability oh, you do on social media. How did you do this, Chris? Man, you know, um, honestly, there's one thing above all else that I think has really helped me. There's this concept that, like, I create motivation. Like, oh, I need to get the motivation to do this. And I say this to my clients all the time. You don't create motivation from thin air. You take action and then motivation kicks in and the likelihood that you're going to do something continue to do it or finish it is amplified. So I just wouldn't take my own nonsense. I would not live in my denial that I couldn't do something. Um, I would, even on days when I didn't want to, you know, I would force myself to get up and go, um, eat more of these things that are good for me, less of these things. I do not believe in elimination diets. When people ask me what food I've cut out, I can proudly say none, none. You know, I eat less you know, less processed snacks and stuff like that, less fast food and more whole unprocessed foods out of one ingredient. Um, but really what was most important for me was learning that motivation is something that I had to create for myself. I could not take my excuses. I could not take the rationalities I believed and I could not believe everything I saw on social media or the internet. You know, I found great mentors. Um, I had a community around me um, at ACAC, and I had tenacity to really, really, really want something different. And so, you know, things got kind of derailed, um, obviously, back in March when COVID-19 hit. And, like, 
I was unwilling to let that stop the momentum I was on. And so I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I just, I could not imagine backtracking after, after working so hard to have, I think lost maybe, you know, 50 to 60 pounds at that point. So I invested in some home gym equipment and got on with it. I had an online coach and I continued to do my thing. And then something insane happened. Like, so like, for the morbidly obese, terribly scared child who thought he was never going to be one of those people, I got hired as a manager at ACAC. It was one of the best days of my life because I largely credit my time at ACAC for the changes I've been able to make. And... Um, to be able to be an ambassador for a company that literally saves lives, make no mistakes, gyms, fitness centers, and wellness centers, trainers, coaches, mentors, they save lives. And um, I have to say that the fact that I was able to pull my whole life, not only physically, emotionally, and mentally, but to end my time with restaurants and go into a career in fitness aquatics mind-blowing. I'm now a certified nutrition coach. Um, I'm, I have my certified personal training exam on November 8th. And like, I don't mind telling you, I get emotional about it. Like, you know, for so long you, you envision yourself a certain way and that image sticks and you have to keep acting as though you're where you want to be. And, um, I felt invisible for 29 years and like, the thing that I have gained most from good health, I want to be seen, I want to be a part of, and I want to help other people do what I've done um, while I'm still doing it. It's like, you know, come with me. And there's this thing I'm really leaning into right now. Maybe this won't work for me, okay? I don't know where this goes, but what if? And every time I allow myself to lean into the what ifs, I quit doing something insane that was holding me back. I lose 100 pounds. I get employed by a fitness center. We are in charge of our own destinies. God, I love this guy. I love this guy. Um, I, there's so many comments coming in. I'm not going to be able to read all of them, but I'm going to try. Um, here we go. Rebecca C. Say Bushy. Chris Skipper, you're an inspiration, my friend. Sean Shanks, I love you, Chris Skipper. Karen Skipper, maybe family of yours. I love you, Chris. Sean, love you, Mom. Sean Dwayne Johnson, love you, Chris. Rebecca, absolutely love you. Julia uh, Beal is watching. Love you, Chris. Thank you for coaching me and teaching me life-changing lessons. Forever grateful. You inspire us all. Carter Kitchen, my favorite person ever. And, and it continues. You, uh, you right there, we're getting, and I am getting emotional because of you. You were getting vulnerable and emotional and you held it back. I don't want you to hold it back. You are a leader, a agent of positive change in this community. Take me down that road anywhere you want to go. Oh man, I don't know. Um, the crazy thing is, it's like, you know, would be in like all of them were it's interesting. I never thought that I would be at a point where I would be able to serve as a mentor to someone for anything. And then to serve as someone for health and weight loss, that's nuts. I mean, that's the stuff that you just don't get unless you really dedicate to changing your life. And I want to help people. That's what I want. You know, this is why I'm getting all these certifications. I'm getting them because they're fun and I love the human body and, and the mind. But what I really love is that those little letters I get to put behind my name mean that I get to help people, right? So I want to help people. I, I offer online coaching. I, I will be doing in-person personal training, group fitness instruction, whatever, you name it. If I can help anyone lose, what if, if it's five pounds, if it's 50 pounds, but if I can help them change their why and their how with food, nutrition, and physical activity – then that's important to me because changing my why and my understanding of who I am is what's changed my body and my mind and my soul. And um, 
I'm looking forward to a long career with ACAC, and I'm looking forward to a long career as a fitness and wellness coach, and I'm looking forward to helping as many people as possible and reaching them in any way I can. So, um, Welshie Martinez, you're an inspiration to all of us. Jake Hartogenis, and I'm sorry I'm messing up your last name, Jake. He says Chris Skipper is an absolute legend. Welshie says you are a motivator and an inspiration for everyone. We have somebody that's watching in Athens, Georgia. Jerry, I watch your show all the time, and I'm crying over here because I'm in a similar state with my self-confidence and my physique, and to hear that he's lost 100 pounds in a year is going to motivate me to get off my tail. That's from Athens, Georgia. How does this make you feel? A little overwhelmed. <laughs> a little over um, speaking about being visible, I mean... You know, I, uh, it's still strange to me, um, hearing things like that. I don't know. I don't always know how to, how to receive them. You know, all, all I know is that I'm, I'm really grateful that I'm, um, affecting people that way because that's why I'm so verbose on social media. Jerry knows I'm very active on social media. Um, I'm on Facebook and I utilize it for, for what I believe it should be used for, um, and I'm glad that this this reaches people because sometimes I think I diminish my accomplishments. And I think that comes from living 29 years, never believing that I deserved to be healthy. By the way, everyone deserves to be healthy. i um, just going to sidebar that real quick. But um, I, I don't think, oh, sorry, I don't think that, hey, JR, sweetie, can you stop that? Um, JR, stop that, baby. Um, that's my dog. He's just a little rowdy. Um, so, um, what I would say is that, like, I need to stop diminishing my accomplishments, and I would encourage everyone else to do the same thing and embrace them. Um, Be proud Dr. Of Dr. Rebecca Downey, wow, well done. I love when people attain these goals. It's 90% lifestyle choices and health. Marilyn Walsh, you're an inspiration, Chris. Please continue. James King, watching from King Family. I mean, it's going on and on and on. I mean, you are, you are, dude, you are one of those dudes in this community that is like a positive agent for change. And that's why we wanted to have you on the show. Like, I've seen you at ACAC over this like 12 month period of time, dude. And I've seen like, I'm a big fan of like, energy and people's energy orbits and I have seen your energy orbit with your body go and do a, a 180 dude I mean you yesterday when I saw you at ACAC you were like chin up like swagger and self-confidence and it wasn't in a, a non-humble way it was done in a way where it was like I believe in myself and that was like I was like, there's the man. There's the man. How about a message to everybody that's watching, like, like the folks that are in Athens right now, that are feeling hopeless or in a dark spot or lacking self-confidence? I mean, isn't the first one the hardest? I mean, anywhere you want to go, Chris. Okay. Here's what I think I would say. I think I, think I would go in a statement of what if, you know, um, what if I just tried something small today that was a little different than yesterday? And then what if I added a little more on and a little more on and believed that it might work and then just roll with it? And I am here to tell you I'm living, breathing. I would go so far as to say thriving proof that small actions add up to crazy results. I'm living a life that I literally thought was impossible for someone like me. That's a lie. We tell ourselves lies all the time that diminish who we really are. Don't listen to it. Try something differently. What if it works? You're amazing. You're absolutely amazing. I'm so grateful for your vulnerability. I'm so grateful for um, speaking from the heart. Uh, you have moved and impacted people today on the show. I, you know what? I'm going to straight up say this. I want to get you back on this program routinely. Um, you've made the program better. Um, guys, if you have a chance to connect with this man, he's going to figure out a way 
to, to help you with your goals and your gains and the self-confidence that you are searching for, whether it's nutrition or exercise or working out, he can put a plan in place. You are the man. I mean that. Jerry, thank you so much for having me on. I mean, I, ser I seriously, I was very nervous about this because like I, I love, love Charlottesville. Moving here changed my life. And if I can, if I can be a member of this society who, who helps it to be even better than I already think it is, then that's the whole game, baby. That's the whole goal. You're not only a member, you're a leader. I mean that. I mean that. I'm grateful. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Right, you have a good one. Chris Skipper, he just crushed that. Give it a like and a share for Chris Skipper, please. I mean, give it a like and a share. This whole show is about featuring people that are positively impacting Charlottesville. That's what this show is about. Jude, I have Susan on the line. Susan, you got some big shoes to follow right here on today's program, and I know that you're going to be able to fill these shoes. The executive director from the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust. Susan, the show is yours anywhere you want to go. Anywhere I want to go. Wow. Well, good to see you, Jerry. Um, I want to say that I ran into a mutual friend of ours, Todd Proctor. Oh, yeah. He, he was pretty excited to talk about you. Todd's the man. So that was, yeah, he really is. He really is. Um, and I also want to say I'm not quite ready to just talk about the land trust. I feel like we have to talk about COVID-19 a little bit. I, I kind of think the disease became real for a lot of people today after hearing the news about the president and the first lady. Um, and I kind of think as shocking as the news is, um, I was noticing how the news cameras were panning to the, um, to the White House. And it got me thinking about um, during their 10 day quarantine, how much of a home is your sanctuary? So that's kind of maybe my transition for why the land trust is important to talk about right now. Um, I also anecdotally spoke with a family member who was saying how she was wiping the rail of her condo staircase every day as she walked out because she didn't want to pass COVID and she didn't want to catch COVID. And those are the sorts of things that when you're a homeowner of a single family detached or a duplex, um, you don't have to worry about quite as much. You're still worried about COVID, that's for sure. But that's where I connect this back to the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust mission, which is to bring permanent, affordable home ownership to our community for folks earning 80% or less of the area median income. To date, uh, our homes have been single family detached or duplex units, no handrails, and, uh, and it's just a simple home ownership situation with the ground lease. Um, and I say simple. But I really do appreciate the chance to talk about it with you, Jerry, because it, it doesn't always come across intuitively for people. It's, it is the land trust is fairly unique where the homeowner owns the building, the land trust owns the home, and this effectively lowers the mortgage by 20 to 40 percent. So that that can make a huge difference for people. Um, and we hold on to those ground leases for 90 years. And uh, and that that home can be bought and sold, in which case that ground lease renews. The homeowner who sells takes a certain portion of equity, but then the house stays um, stays affordable for the next family, earning 80% or, or less of area mean income. But the big news for us today also is uh, just before the Blue Ridge Home Builders Parade of Home launches, um, we were part of that Parade of Homes last year with our Nassau Street Homes built to zero energy standards. Anyway, before they launch, we are launching our own information campaign and fundraiser for our next build. Um, we've got the construction financing in place, and so we typically reach out for donations, grant donors, and so forth to address land costs. So we're launching our fundraiser um, for a property that we have uh, a contract on in the city of Charlottesville near the Dairy Building. Um, so we're finishing those costs, and the fundraiser is called the Social Equity Game. Um, I sent ahead to Judah the flyer, but it basically... They're on screen. They're on screen now. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, it emulates the game of Monopoly, but it's not. <laughs> it's the social equity game. We're breaking down barriers for home ownership um, with the land trust homes. We're helping people who couldn't imagine buying a home being able to get there financially. 
And so the way the game works is we have four teams who are going to be reaching out to friends, families, and colleagues, family and colleagues, um, to share information about the land trust and its next build and its mission. So that's really important. That tells people about the land trust who just don't know about it. They don't know that it's here. They don't know that it's had a track record for 12 years. They don't know it's an important tool in the affordable housing spectrum of solutions. Um, and then just a little bit about the teams. We've got in the four teams, community leaders. We have realtors. We have developers. We have business owners. We have retired business owners. These folks all get why affordable housing is so important. When you don't have places for your talent to live in the community, they're going to go elsewhere for a job. And then talent recruitment gets to be an issue for growing a business. So I just want to put that one out there. The realtors and the developers especially get it. They work with housing construction and sales every day. They know how expensive homes have become in our area. Um, I want to just mention if people go online, uh, they can look, they can Google the Regional Housing Partnership. They just hosted a fall speaker series with the chief economist for Virginia Realtors, Dr. Sturdivant. And those slides from her presentation are posted on um, the Regional Housing Partnership um, September 25th event. And what it does is it paints a picture that housing affordability is going to be one of our community's number one issues, if not the number one. The simple supply and demand shown on slides 16 and the home pricing shown on slides 18, it's going to be tough for people trying to get into um, the market as first time home buyers. And then even our local car um, sales data shows that um, prices for houses in our area have increased. I was just reading this. They've increased five consecutive quarters. Like the houses aren't coming down at all. Five consecutive quarters they've gone up. The average home price for us now is three thirty one five hundred. We sold those Nassau homes for two fifteen. Just saying. One hundred fifteen thousand off the average because the land trust owns the land, guys. That shows you the value of what they're doing. And she's 100% right. One of the many byproducts of COVID-19 is this phenomenon. You have ridiculously low interest rates as the Federal Reserve tries to backstop the economy and jumpstart the economy. You have a flight from urban environments like Northern Virginia, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York City, Boston. People that got a touch of Charlottesville in four years at the University of Virginia went to a big city for a big payday for a big time company. Now they're realizing that their apartment or their home has evolved and it needs to be more of a palace where there's a Zoom room. There needs to be a backyard for kids that are learning virtually that don't have the playground at recess um, at a school to get that energy out. Now playground and recess is in the backyard. There may need to be two Zoom rooms if the husband and wife are both working from home. I mean, the evolution <laughs> of the house is changed because of COVID. We're seeing people leave these densely populated urban environments with bags of money coming to Charlottesville and Central Virginia and driving up the cost of living. And if it's not for organizations like Susan's, Thomas uh, Jefferson Community Land Trust, we are going to face a serious affordability issue. Show is yours, Susan. Keep educating us. That first take you had was absolute fire. Yeah, I mean, I even go back to Dr. Sturdivant's data again. Again, Regional Housing Partnership, September 25th slides, if you Google that. She shows that there has been a chronic gap. And you, you can imagine there's been a chronic gap since the 1968 Fair Housing Act was passed um, between black owned households and white and white home ownership rates. Um, and guess what? That gap is getting bigger over time, not smaller. So that's that's concerning. That's definitely concerning. And that's why the land trust mission is so important, because that is another tool for helping um, those earning 80% of area median income, regardless of race, background, whatever, um, and enabling those families to get into the wealth building pathway of the middle class home ownership. That's what it is. It's, it's wealth building for the middle class. So if they're not able to get in, 
they're not able to create wealth for their families and future generations. That's that's very concerning. So anyway, we've got the game out there. Um, the land trust model keeps it affordable for generations or, you know, um, families trying to become homeowners. And if people want to learn more about the game, I would just say at this point, um, we're already getting some good buzz about it. Uh, we've collected thus far um, about 4,000 in donations nice. just in putting together the program. So that's that's really exciting. And then um, if people want to learn more about the land trust, I would say just go to the, the website and uh, there should be a button coming up. Um, people have reached out to me individually for donations, but there should be a button coming up and then you can pick the team you want to support. Like, as I said, there's four teams, Team Monticello, Team Nassau, Team Franklin Street, Team Carlton Out. These are all places that we have our projects. So, Well, you're doing amazing things. Guys, this get involved with the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust. Folks that are looking to purchase a piece of property, this is a legitimate, authentic, and very real option. We've had a chance to conversate with some of the owner, homeowners on this show. These are teachers, folks that work for the University of Virginia, I mean, folks that we see every day at the grocery store, around town, and on the downtown mall, wherever it may be, they are making a huge impact. Susan, anything else? You really brought your A-plus game today. I mean, you are oh, a gosh. tremendous ambassador of this organization, and I sincerely mean that. Is there anything else we're missing that needs to be covered? Um, I just want to thank the homeowners who've come on the show to talk with you. I've really enjoyed hearing Seti talk about his family. Um, you know, he a um, quality of life than what his parents had back with Rwanda to Tanzania. And, you know, getting to come here to, as a function of the International Rescue Committee and what he was saying about how refugees get assigned to certain, um, you know, it's enabled him to have a terrific quality of life. And uh, that was just really wonderful to hear him get to talk about his favorite things in Charlottesville. So I, yeah. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that interview last Friday. It's archived on ilovesevil.com. Um, a family that went through the land trust and speaking of the value proposition the land trust offered them and how it's shaping their version of the American dream and shaping how they are building wealth for their family unit. And it's impactful, impressive, emotional, and very real. Um, you are super legit. And every time you come on this show, and when you came on the show, you already set the bar high. But every time you come on the show, you're like an Olympic pole vaulter that is clearing her personal best every Friday that you come on. Susan, I am grateful for you and your time. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good afternoon. Great you, weekend, everyone. And don't forget, if you want to get in on the social equity game, it's out there. Let's get on Thanks. the website, support the equity game. Thank you, Susan. Um, love Fridays on this network. The whole premise of the I Love Seville show and the I Love Seville network is to spotlight agents of positive change that are doing good things for this community, whether in the nonprofit space, whether in the small business, medium-sized business space, whether in the health or nutrition space, we have so many people doing amazing things. And it's gonna be very different than any talk show or any news broadcast you've ever had. We don't care about the police blotter. We don't care about the crime and the negativity that's jammed down our throats. We are gonna flip the model and we're gonna talk hope and positivity on this network. That's the premise. It's the best of Charlottesville and Central Virginia. Um, a couple of items I want to get to before I get to comments that are coming in. Chris Skipper, you really made an impact today, dude. Really made an impact. Uh, Judah Wickhauer, let's go to first sports quickly, and then we'll open up comments. If you have comments you want to get in the stream, or if you want comments on air, put them in the comments section now, and I will relay them on air. From a sports standpoint, this is concerning. We know how it has a trickle over or keeping up the Joneses effect. The Patriot League, sources have indicated to ESPN, the Patriot League in men's basketball is going to nix or ax it's out of conference schedule and only focus on in conference games beginning in 2021 with an 18 game conference schedule. This is done to keep COVID in check. The financial ramifications are massive 
for the schools outside the Power Five that rely on playing the big time schools out there for a payday just for showing up. The Patriot League gonna nix out of conference basketball, um, out of conference games. Judah, let's get this on screen. UVA at Clemson. The game kicks off tomorrow night, 8 p.m. ACC Network, a rematch of the ACC Championship. The Tigers, a 28 and a half point favorite. The line opened at 28.5 on Monday. It dropped midweek to 27 and change. It's back up to 28 and a half. Vegas sees this as a rout. I wonder how Bronco and this Virginia football team are gonna perform on Saturday against the best of the best. Time will tell. Virginia Tech, a 12 and a half point favorite. Judah, get that on screen. The line with the Hokies and the Blue Devils open on Monday at 10 and a half. It's now Hokies favored by 12 and a half. The game kicks off at 4 p.m. right before the UVA and Clemson matchup. Virginia Tech and UVA chomping at the bit to be up there in the ACC standings. Remember, you have Clemson and Miami as the creme of the creme in the conference. Five teams in the ACC ranked in the top 25. Virginia and Virginia Tech also want similar distinctions. Now it's Friday night. Judah, I think we have date night suggestions, sandwich suggestions, and Italian food suggestions. If you're looking for a date night, if you're looking for something to do with the family, why don't I start with the family first? My family, my wife and son, we're gonna go pumpkin picking this weekend. Goochland has got some pumpkin picking options. Buckingham County has got some pumpkin picking options. I very much encourage anyone to consider this from an outside, safe COVID, family and kid friendly type of situation. After pumpkin picking, maybe we do a little Ix Park where we can go to a three notched or enjoy Brazos tacos right in the green space at Ix. Okay, there's a lot of fantastic options we can do from a safe and social distance standpoint. From a sandwich standpoint, we get this question all the time. What's the best sandwich out there? We know Ivy Provisions back open again. Ivy Provisions has got one of the best sandwich offerings undoubtedly in this community. I'm a huge fan of Curtis Shaver and Peloton Station. If you've watched this show, you know I, I, I love that brand and that restaurant. And I say often on this program, the best Italian sub in Charlottesville, Virginia is at Anna's Number 9 on Maury Avenue. You call them up, Anna's Number 9 on Maury Avenue. You say, I want the Italian sub, and I want it Jerry Miller's way. And I think for the money, that is the best sub in the city of Charlottesville. And it's less than $9. It is so good. Italian food, we're lucky to have some fantastic ones. Sal's Cafe Italia in the downtown mall, the Finazzo family, Mangione's on West Main Street, Vivace, just off the top of my head. Three darn good ones. Let's not forget Tavola and Belmont. I know I'm leaving some folks out, but Tavola, Vivace, Sal's Cafe Italia, uh, Mangione's on the downtown, Man Mangione's on West Main. These four spots you cannot go wrong with if you're looking for Italian food this weekend for a date night option, okay? I really very much love what Sal's Cafe Italia has done with creating kind of an outside bar. They already have the patio seating, it's amazing. Vivace has the luxury of having ample outside space. Landon and his team are doing amazing things at Vivace. Mangione's, don't sleep on Mangione's. They may not have the outside seating, they have limited inside seating, but curbside and takeout is still being offered. Um, Mick and Elena, they're doing amazing things at Mangione's. Guys, the whole premise of this program is to feature the best of Charlottesville and Central Virginia. I hope you saw it today with Marty, with Chris, with Susan. Um, get, put your comments in the comment section now. We will relay them on air, anything you want to talk about we will talk about on air. Um, I will adapt to your perspective. Judah, let's give some love to our friends at Scott Wagner Integrated Medicine. Scott Wagner at Integrated Medicine, changing people's lives through chiropractic care, sports medicine, and physical therapy. Who's got your back? Dr. Wagner and his team 
have your back. Um, all right, comments coming in. Now's the time to get it. We'll get to you Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Snapchat. Um, Barbara Lundgren, honor your reservations at the restaurants. Amen, Barb. Honor your reservations. If you make a reservation, keep your reservation. Do not make multiple reservations and no call, no show these restaurants. They're counting on us more than ever. You make a reservation, keep a reservation. Barbara says, amen. We don't eat without farmers. Farmers are the best. Thank you, Barbara Lundgren. Jamie Stuckey, thank you for sharing the show. We're very grateful for you sharing the show. Um, Ted Horn just shared the, the game of equity, Susan, for the Franklin Avenue team. Thank you, Ted Horn, for sharing that link. He's pro Franklin Avenue team. Um, Ted Horn says, a much needed addition to the affordable housing market. James King of King Family Vineyards, he says, I'm happy to play on Team Nassau. Love that, James King. Ted Horn says, Franklin Street team all the way. Gentlemen, thank you for sharing this perspective on the show. We very much love when you do that. Uh, wow, there's a heck of a lot of comments coming in. Um, Rebecca, Chris Skipper, you're an inspiration. Sean, I love you, Chris Skipper. Karen, Chris's mom, I love you, son. Sean Johnson, I love you, Chris Skipper. Rebecca, again, I love you, Chris Skipper. I mean, you got me crying over here, Chris Skipper. He had me crying. Uh, Rebecca, hell yes, this vulnerability is amazing. Sean, leadership and service, way to knock it out of the park, Chris. James King, I'm excited to help out. With the Land Trust, Sarah Whitney, Tiger Fuel Company is committed to supporting our local community and serving our neighbors in need. We are proud to support the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust with a $1,000 donation. This is an important step in helping people find affordable housing this, in this area. We are also grateful for our long-term partnerships with, the, with AHIP, Home Repair Nonprofit. We served up the AHIP special at our markets the last few months and raise $1,000 to keep our neighbors safe and comfortable in their homes. Thank you for that. Sarah Whitney, this is what you really need to do. This is a suggestion, just a suggestion, Sarah Whitney. You create an island, and we have the trademark here, so you need to talk to me first. We've got Uncle Sam in my corner. You create an I Love Seville sandwich. An I Love Seville sandwich at the markets for Tiger Fuel. And then you utilize, allow us to utilize the I Love Seville network that reaches over 253,000 unique people a year. And you allow us to use our network to push the I Love Seville sandwich at the markets at Tiger Fuel. And that $1,000 you raise through the AHIP special will be 10x, 10 times that amount with an I Love Seville sandwich and this platform that we've built. Seriously, that will go effing bananas. Matthew Steinmart, um, by word of mouth, Automotive LLC just contributed $3,000 to the Carlton team. I love that. Marilyn Walsh, you're an inspiration to us, Chris. Dr. Downey, we love when you watch the program, Rebecca. We love when you watch the program, Rebecca. Thank you. We, we welcome you on the show anytime you want, Rebecca Downey. We have tremendous respect for you. The I Love Seville Daily Digest airs at 5 p.m. on this network. We take this entire show and we relay it to you in five minutes or less, five days a week, at 5 o'clock. The I Love Seville Daily Digest presented by Ting Fiber Internet saved $288 through... I love Seville.ting.com, the best internet possible. Dude, it is so effing fast. I love Seville.ting.com if you want what we're experiencing here. And guys, once you get it, you don't go back. I'm going to close the show with 60 seconds of vulnerability, honesty, and genuine perspective from, from my heart. Oftentimes on this show, you see me get emotional. And the reason I get emotional on this program is I understand what it takes for someone like Chris Skipper to come before thousands of people, send us photos of before and after the transformation of his body. And that is vulnerability that 
few have experienced. When you're in front of this many people and you're being real and you're being honest and you're not using a mental, you know, a, a, a filter, you're just being who you are, it gets everything that's tucked away somewhere inside your body rushing to the top of your, your brain. And I think we are so blessed in this community to have so many people that are committed to leaving their footprint in a better place than they first arrived. That's why I fell in love with Charlottesville a month into my first semester at the University of Virginia. I knew this was going to be my home. We close on this note. We're all feeling a little scared, a little hopeless, a little uncertain because of this pandemic that we call COVID-19. We see the president and his wife now have COVID. I understand we're all feeling this way, and it's not unique to you. But if a gentleman like Chris Skipper can lose 100 pounds in 12 months, when half that time was done in a COVID landscape when gyms were closed, then you and I can do anything if we put our minds to it as well. Utilize Chris as an inspiration to tackle those demons, to tackle the hopelessness or the feelings of uncertainty that you're feeling inside. Realize that you can manage them, overcome them. And one small step, tag with another small step, tag with another small step, and another small step, and another small step, leads to massive positive gains. Let's do this. I'm Jerry Miller. It's the I Love Seville Show. You guys have a great weekend. I love you guys. Dude, you had me. Great show today.